Good morning, church. Are you glad you came to church? <laughs> Ask your neighbor, do you trust me? <laughs> wow. Who do you trust? Who can't you trust? Let me ask you. Is there a man who promised to marry you, but after sleeping with you, he ghosted you? He blocked your phone? Or maybe he married you just to realize he's a serial cheater? And as years pass by now, you're fearing whether you can get another husband. Or maybe you married an irresponsible man. You thought he will be your provider. He has become your main liability. The man you thought he would help you grow in your personal, professional, and spiritual life needs help. Maybe you are a man listening to me this morning. You trusted a woman who has multiple sex partners. Now and then, she is dropped by different men to your house. Or maybe all she wanted from you is money. Or whatever she needed from you, after she got it, she has despised you. Her attitude towards you has changed. She fakes out-of-town assignments just to stay away from you. Or maybe you invested your money in a financial scheme. You have promised good return on your investment. As years pass by, it's evident to you right now that it was a financial scam. You were caught. You lost money. Now you're paranoid about investments. You don't want to invest anything anywhere. Maybe you trusted an employer and gave your all. You worked in that company as though it was your own business. Just to be summarily dismissed on frimsy grounds because of your employer's personal insecurities. Now you don't trust any employer. You're insecure with any job. Or perhaps you work in a corporation where you have been many employees and you trusted a young employee with a high responsibility just to put your name, your job, your life on the line. You are served with court orders on money router. Now, you resent every young employee. You huddle them at arm's length. Or perhaps you help someone in the hour of need. You hosted them in your own house. Just for that girl to sleep with your husband. Or to badmouth you. Or maybe you hosted your nephew, your cousin, your younger brother who defiled your daughter. You have now vowed never again will I host anyone in my house. Or maybe you just gave somebody some money when they were very needy. When you started looking back for them to repay, they blocked your phone. And now you have sworn never again will I lend money to anyone. Trust has been betrayed. If any of the situations I described still make you emotional, you are yet to recover from the betrayal. Trust is a very emotive subject. This morning, I want to ask you four questions on trust. Question one, do you trust people? Do you trust people? Do you give people a chance? Can you give someone a second chance? Has your trust been so crushed that you fight it so hard to trust anybody? Trust is the glue that holds relationships. Without trust, there is no marriage. 
trust is the foundation of marriage. Trust is the currency upon which all business transactions take place. Any product or service you buy, you either trust the product or the service. Business is done by people, for people, through people. You can't drive in business unless you trusted employees, customers, and your service providers. If you are self-employed and you don't trust people, that business will never outgrow you. It will be stuck in you. You are the business, you are the system. When you get sick, the business gets sick. When you die, the business dies. Unless you trust people, you cannot grow in business. And that's the question I want to ask you right now. Do you trust people? Can you give them a chance? Or do you generalize people because of what you've gone through? You see, a lot of guys, because one man cheated on you, you hear a lot of women saying, men cheat. No, uh -huh. Men don't cheat, that guy cheated you. You hear a lot of men saying, hey, women can kill you. Ah, uh -uh, you're still alive. She didn't kill you. And the fact that one woman stressed you doesn't mean women are like that. Idiots are bad employers. No. Talk about that idiot, that Ghanaian, that Australian. Don't generalize people. Hey, in-laws are poison. Who's in-laws? My in-laws are good. Teenagers are mad. Uh-uh, your teenager is mad. My teenage girl is the best teenager I have ever seen. I suggest this morning, do not stereotype people based on their color, tribe, race, nationality, gender, or age group. Question number two. Can you be trusted? Have you ever given people a reason to trust you? Have you ever given people a reason not to trust you? Gentlemen, can you be trusted with a woman? Can a woman come to your house and feel safe and secure? Do you even trust yourself? Woman, if today you are the personal assistant of the governor of Georgia, or the CEO of a Fortune 500 company, or the PA of the president, can you be trusted to travel with him all over the nation or overseas without trying to lure him into a compromised situation? Can you really be trusted? Can you be trusted with money? public money, church money, family money. People even squander family money. People call me. We invested with my husband. Five years later, I can't tell where the money is. Can you be trusted? Can you go to a bank where you have been a customer for the last five years and they give you a facility because of your word? with no collateral, no security. Can your word be banked? Can your word secure a board? You see, promotion is a position of trust. Let me emphasize that. Promotion is a position of trust. That means if you're working in a corporate organization, Five years later, you are stuck in the same position. You have a trust gap. They are saying, we think we can't trust your temperaments to handle our employees. We can't trust you with a bigger budget. We can't trust you with our resources. You might carry them home. Every single position they give you is a trust position. They are saying, this is the much we can trust you. This is the only budget we can trust you. These are the only number of employees we can put under your watch. Promotion is not about your hard work, your IQ, your persistence, but it's about trust. Can you be trusted with a higher responsibility? Ed, if you have betrayed 
somebody's trust. I want to give you three suggestions to regain the trust. Because when you betray trust, it hurts. Trust is never given. Trust is tested and earned. So if you have betrayed trust, let me give you three things to do to regain trust. Number one, apologize with no conditions. Number two, be transparent. Matters money, time, and passwords. Let me repeat. Be transparent with all you earn and how you spend. Be transparent with your time, where you are, with who, doing what, at any given moment. And be disclose your passwords. Passwords to your phone, to your tablet, iPad, laptop. Stop carrying your phone to your bathroom. What are you hiding? You're married, naked and not ashamed. So be transparent in your life. And number three, and by the way, before I go to number three, your partner has absolute right to your gadgets, to how you spend your money, to how you spend your time. It's not a privilege. It's a right. And number three, more about that in a marriage seminar. I'll be doing a single seminar on 14th of February. If you're planning to be married, we'll get into details. And number three, to regain trust, forgive yourself. If Christ forgave you, who are you to condemn yourself? And if you are the offended party, learn to forgive your partner. Stop revisiting the same subject ten years later. Just like God in Christ forgave you, learn to forgive your partner. At least for your own sanity. Because the more you carry baggage, the more you don't forgive others, the more you're stressed. This coming Sunday, I will teach you about stress. Unchecked, stress graduates into distress and then into depression. And that can go all the way to suicide. I'll talk about stress this coming Sunday. For now, forgive your partner if they have repented, changed their behaviors, and given you a way forward in terms of transparency. I'm asking you for questions. Trust. Question number three. Do you trust God? Do you trust God? 15th of July, 1859, Charles Blodin walked on a tightrope 160 feet above Niagara Falls, exciting his fans. At some point, he even got into a sack and walked across the rope. At some point, he rode on a bike on the tightrope. And then he took a wheelbarrow, blindfolded, 160 feet high, above the falls. Everybody was excited. He wowed his fans. Then he asked them a question. Do you trust I can carry someone in this wheelbarrow and push them safely on the other side? Everybody said, yeah, 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 yes, yes, yes. Then he said, who will be the first one? <laughs> Nobody. <laughs> it's very easy to say I trust until you trust is tested. When our son Zig was three years old, we decided to take them on a road trip 500 kilometers away. Please understand, it's only in America you talk about miles. 500 kilometers away, and that part of the world, that journey takes about eight hours. Barely 10 minutes into the trip, when the boy heard the word Mombasa Road, he thought we have reached Mombasa. <laughs> so he asked me, Dad, have we reached Mombasa? I didn't know how to explain distance or time. So to try to paint the picture, I told him, we will reach there when it's dark. Now that he understood. And he decided to sleep. <laughs> the thing is this. He figured out he didn't understand the journey. He didn't understand the information. 
but he trusted his father. Without sufficient information, he trusted me. And this is my request for you this morning. Learn to trust God with or without information. Here is why. God never reveals the whole journey to us. Had he done that to you, you would have given up on the journey. Had you seen the roadblocks, the bumps, the barriers, the battles ahead, you would sign defeat. So God, often than not, reveals only one leg of the journey, then the next leg, then the next leg. And then he tells you, I know the plans I have for you. Jeremiah 29, 11. Trust me, I have figured it out. I know the journey. Why does God want you to trust him? Because you are not in charge of your life. You are not in control. Jesus taught in the greatest sermon ever taught. Who of you by worrying can add as he go hour to your life? Worry is unreasonable. It doesn't change ground reality. It doesn't fix your situations. In other words, you cannot add your life even by a single minute. So why not trust an unknown future to a known God? That's the question. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. Proverbs 3 verse 5. Don't trust in your strategies, in your schemes, in your job, in your hard work, in your government or government relief. Put your trust in God. You see, many believers trust mere mortal than man. Any single problem they encounter, for example, if a car just stops by the roadside, breaks down, the first thing that comes to your mind who to rescue me? My brother, my mom, my friend, my whoever. God is always the last resort. Always the last option. And he's telling you right now, cast is the man who trusts in man. Jeremiah 17, 5. But blessed is the man whose trust is in the Lord. Jeremiah 17, 7. The psalmist's son, what we sang this morning just before the sermon. Some trust in chariots. Some trust in horses. But I will put my trust in the name of the Lord my God. Psalms 20 verse 7. I ask you again. Can you really trust God? And get in that wheelbarrow. And trust him to carry you through Niagara Falls on a tightrope. Question number four and the last one. Can God trust you? Can God trust you? Jesus taught, if God cannot trust you with what he has given you, he cannot trust you with more. Luke 16 verse number 10. If God cannot trust you with the blessings you have right now, he cannot trust you with more blessings. God always tests how much we trust him. And he tests through whether we can surrender our bodies as living sacrifice, our energies, our time, and our resources. Jesus said, where your treasures are, there your heart is. Let me surprise you, children of God. God tests trust through what he has given you. And I'll explain to you this point. That's how he tests whether he can trust you. Before I explain, let me say this. How would you feel if your partner does not trust you? How would you feel if you know your boss does not trust you? Trust is mutual. How do you expect God to trust you? If you don't trust God, trust is a mutual transaction. 
And God always, not sometimes, always tests trust. I'll give you so many examples, I'll give you only one. God promised Abraham to be the father of many nations through Isaac. It was very clear. The promise was through Isaac. Then God tells Abraham, sacrifice this boy to me. This is such a serious paradox. It is very easy to doubt, was this really the voice of God? Didn't God say he's making a father of many nations through this boy? That can't be God saying I sacrifice the same boy. But the Bible says, Hebrews eleven nineteen, Abraham reasoned that God is able to raise Isaac from the dead. Let me break it down for you. Abraham reasoned, if God blessed me with this boy, Past the childbearing age, when I was a hundred years old, when nobody gets a child in that age, then I can figure out if I sacrifice him in according to God's command, he is also able to give life to this boy and raise him from the dead. Abraham decided, I will not hold anything from God. Then God trusted him. The Bible says, because you did not withhold anything from me, your one and only son, you'll be the father of many nations. All nations of the earth will be blessed through you. Imagine how hard you work for your personal bread. You try to bread yourself on social media. Because you know the value in a bread, you are paying more for your individuality. You are paying more for your uniqueness. Being in your unique space. But this man, Abraham, he has never marketed himself to us. Over 5,500 years later, we are discussing him today here in Georgia. His name is known all over. In fact, three religions are known as Abrahamic religions. Christianity, Islam, and Judaism. His name is all over the world to date. And this is what God said. I will make your name great. And all nations shall be blessed through you. Why? You have earned my trust. Let me tell you something. It's only in the area of giving where God says, I will test you. And I want you to test me. Whether I can keep my covenant. I want to tell you something very strange. We are living at a time when every credible pastor Every credible pastor does not want to touch about giving. I also hardly speak about it. Why? Because we are all fearing to be branded prosperity preachers. So any credible pastor, this is a subject they no longer touch. This is the scheme of the devil. This is one tool the devil wants to use to destroy the church. He corrupts the genuine. He makes us to fear to speak the truth. Just like in church today, people cannot talk about gazing. I know you're already freaking. People cannot talk about remarriage. People cannot talk about uh, divorce. And I know I may have touched the wrong nerve right now. The area of giving has become the most tricky subject in church. Because the enemy knows The moment I fix pastors never to talk about this because of the many crooks out there, and I ensure the genuine one never tell God's children the truth, you are never blessed. So giving is a by the way. It is something that is pushed on the corner, on the side. In the old covenant, giving was the main sacrifice in worship. It was the main worship. That's why David used to say, I will enter your gates with thanksgiving. He used to carry an ephah for thanksgiving. So the enemy knows. You see, let me tell you something. Not a single soul in the Bible prayed for money. Please understand this. Not a single person from Genesis to Revelation prayed, Oh God, bless me with money. We have unnecessary prayers because no amount of prayers will ever make God to give you money. No amount of prayers. God works with a very simple principle. Sowing and reaping. If you don't work, 
you don't get anything. When it comes to financial breakthrough, he says, keep your part of the bargain. This is a covenant. I have sealed it. I'll keep my part of the bargain if you keep your part of the bargain, period. You can cry, you can dance, you can go for a night vigil, but God will not be moved when you're living in obedience, in disobedience. There are two reasons why people give sparingly in church. Maybe three. Number one, they are not taught. Why? Pastors don't want to teach this. Number two, we don't trust God. So every time we give in church, we think we are losing money. So you don't want to lose a lot. So you can only give what you can afford to lose. It's a trust question. And number three, it's our expectations. Last Sunday, I was teaching about expectations. Our expectations are this low. When you're expecting so little, you give so little. Paul said, if you give sparingly, you reap sparingly. In other words, Paul said, how much harvest do you want? How much seed do you plant? That's the question Paul was saying. Let me tell you God's children. God operates on principles. You can pray, speak in tongues, and divorce. Because marriage operates with principles. If you don't follow them, there is no anointing oil that will fix your marriage. Are you with me? It is the same thing I'm telling you about finances. This truth, we are shy from teaching it, and it's the devil's strategy. You know, last December, the Lord spoke to my master and I and told us to give 16000 to this church, dollars. I, I, I mentioned the currency because we have online church. And they might think I'm mentioning Naira or Kenya sharing. $16,000 to this church. When we obeyed that because of the project we are doing here, and this project will continue for the next about four weeks, let me tell you, God has surprised us right in this church. I'll give you one or two or three examples how God has surprised us. Last Sunday, somebody, one of you, one of our members, came here and gave 2,000 in one offering. 2,000 US dollars in one offering. Another one who is still here listening to me, she said, Pastor, I want to buy a guitar. I want to give 700 for a guitar. Just think about that. Someone buys the Holy Communion elements, and I've never asked her to do that. Somebody has been buying the screens for the media department. I've never asked him. I have never called, sent a text to any of you asking for a special offering. We have never done a fundraising here. There is something I learned. When we live in obedience, God somehow provides. God is in this place. How do you know? Let me tell you. The evidence that God is in a place is not how much you speak in tongues. It is how much you can trust God. I asked you, can you be on that tightrope and allow God to carry you in that wheelbarrow? God did not know the faithfulness of Abraham through prayers. It is how much you're willing to give his all to God. That's how you know God is in a place. God is in this place. I can tell you. I, I, I was telling our deacon, in this church, we will never do a fundraising. I don't believe in it. I believe God can touch God's children just to do their part. But let me make a disclaimer here. Maybe when you heard me mention those figures, you're wondering, God, I don't have that much. Don't be bothered by that. God will never demand from you what he has not given you. Don't be bothered by that. You see, God is concerned with what he has already given you. That's why Jesus said, this woman who has given two cents has given the most. Why? God is concerned with something called proportion. That's why the concept of tithe had nothing to do with the law. It was a revelation of worship. When Abraham tithed and Jacob tithed, it was long before the law of Moses. They did it as a revelation. The enemy fights giving because it blocks your blessings. The first murder case, the murder of Abel, is because someone was jealous. This guy has given God something valuable, and God is going to bless him. 
Can you imagine the very first murder case is because the enemy wanted to attack our giving back to God. You see, we give because we recognize God has given us everything. Every good and perfect gift comes from above, the Bible says. So I don't want you to ever fall trap of the enemy. Don't ever feel guilty about how much you give. Your concern should be what proportion of what God has given me. So Jacob figured out, if God has given me ten cows, I will surrender one to him. If God has given me a hundred bags of wheat, I will surrender ten to him. As a law? No. As what? As an indication, a response of my worship to God. David said, I will not give God what will cost me nothing. So why did I teach you this this morning? It is because I want you to know what affects your giving is your trust level. And God tests your trust level by the percentage you are able to say, he gave me everything, everything belongs to him, even my ability to work, my health, my life belongs to God. I can afford to give God what costs me something. Church is not a place for throwing change or the way you tip the waiter in the, in the restaurant. Don't ever play those games with God because you're wasting everything. Make sure you are a purposeful worshiper. So when we come for giving, and I have not talked about giving for more than a year, so listen keenly. It is not a side issue. It is part of worship. So we come to church primarily for three things. Otherwise, God lives in you. You can worship at home. Why do you come here? We come here, number one, to worship the Lord together. He said he dwells in the midst of his praises. He said where two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst. Reason number two, we come here to be taught the word of God. For you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. It is the knowledge of the truth that sets us free. And how shall they hear unless they are preached to? Paul asks. So we come to hear the word of God. And number three, hear it from me. We gather together every Sunday to bring our offerings to God. That was the concept of the synagogue. We come to worship the Lord with our substances. This is not a side issue. It is part of our worship. I want to stop there. And before I pray, I would like you to take two minutes. Look at my eyes. Don't close your eyes yet. And ask the Lord, what are you telling me this morning? The reason I wanted to do that, many times when we hear the message, we are thinking, I wish so and so had it. I wish so and so was in church today. Listen. The Spirit of God knows everybody on this planet and only gathered you to hear what I'm saying. This is not a message for someone else. It's not a message for those who didn't come to church. God, in his manifold wisdom, wanted you and you only to hear this message. So I want you to take a moment. Soul search and pray. Ask God, what are you telling me right now? What are you saying to me? Because you can come Sunday after Sunday and never change. Just take a moment and ask the Lord, what are you telling me, Lord? What are you saying to me? Lord, we worship you. We love you today. Father, I pray that you may open the eyes of understanding of your children. Let this message of trust find a resting ground in their hearts. Before I pray for other needs, if you're watching me on social media, you want to receive the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, this is the first step. You offer your fast to God as a living sacrifice. God is more interested with your life than your substances. 
if you want to commit your life to the Lord Jesus Christ, to be your Lord and your Savior, pray this prayer after me. Lord Jesus Christ, come into my heart. Be my Lord and my Savior. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer, you are born again. You have confessed Jesus as Lord and Savior. Just write for me very simple words on this Facebook page. I prayed to be saved. I prayed to be saved. I will identify you, reach out to you, and enroll you in my new believers class. Just write simple words. I prayed to be saved. Church, I want to request you to stand. Can I have your hands like this? The Lord bless you. The Lord increase you. The Lord protect you. The Lord keep you in perfect health. May the Lord protect your loved ones from any sickness, from any attack from the enemy. May the Lord be your light. May the Lord be the lamp to your feet. May the Lord bless your going out and your coming in. May the Lord keep you in perfect health and in perfect peace. Walk this week in power. Walk this week in confidence. Walk this week with the Lord. In Jesus' name. And everybody say, it. Amen. Shalom. Praise the Lord. Isn't that beautiful? My mind is like, woo! There's so much to do. That was so, so beautiful. So at this moment, I'd like to welcome you all to Family Church. We thank you, the online uh, people who tuned in this morning to be with us. We thank you, thank you, thank you. And if anything, I would be so happy to see you right here where we are. But we understand you're far and wide. But you may know friends and family who are here in Georgia. So please let them know that they can represent you and come and fellowship with us. Now, our address is 2237 Olive Springs Road, Marietta, Georgia. Again, it's 2237 Marietta, Georgia. Our service is 10 to 11, 10 to 11 Eastern Standard Time. It's a beautiful time to give. And it's so nice that we can exercise what we just learned this morning. It is blessed to give than to receive. And many times I forget myself that when in a position to give, I'm actually blessed because the alternative waiting to receive is usually a very difficult place, right? So God loves a cheerful giver. The details are on your screen. So go ahead and offer those gifts and offerings to God and family church. Thank you for partnering with us. And before I let you go, before you get busy with your Sunday, go to the comments line and give us your takeaway. Give us your feedback. Dr. Jacob is so very interested to each and every one of your input. And that way, the Lord leads him to talk to us and apply those things in our daily lives. Coming Sunday, he said it. You'll be speaking on stress. And some of us think stress is for the sick and the weak and the suffering and the depressed. But guess what? No. <laughs> so you want to go and tell your friends, you may know somebody who will be interested in this. Let us join together next Sunday. So have a blessed week and we will see you on Sunday. God bless you. Have you been blessed by this video? Please like and share with family, friends, and colleagues. Great people are either sources of light or they are mirrors that reflect the light. Be a channel of blessings to others and hit the subscribe button to enjoy thousands of my videos free of charge.